Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Progressive Bitcoiner, and happy 2024. Uh, this will be the first episode back in the new year. It was recorded just before the holidays, so not that that long ago, but uh, who better to bring on for our first episode back than Jason Mayer. Uh, many of you will know Jason. He's been on our show before and with Mark previously and on other Bitcoin uh, shows and doing things around the globe now, which is crazy to say, but he's the author of A Progressive's Case for Bitcoin. He's a teacher, a progressive, a Bitcoiner, and we have such a good conversation and talk about so many things and really just look at the the whole year ahead, uh, 2024. Uh, at this point of the, the recording, the recording coming out, we're assuming that a spot ETF might be right around the corner um, from when we had the conversation. And when the conversation airs, there's the halving coming up, there's a political cycle. So we really take a good look at the landscape of 2024 and just ask the question, you know, what the hell is going to happen in 2024? Do we have any idea of what's coming with so many things? Uh, so we talk about this. We talk about the fact that Bitcoin, with all of the positive things that's been happening, is not necessarily inevitable and how we need to stay vigilant with talking to people and helping uh, people understand Bitcoin and educate them on Bitcoin, which Jason does such a fantastic job of at local meetups, just in his own community through his book and travels, of course, and has been doing such a good job of getting the word out about Bitcoin and how progressives in the left can actually be into Bitcoin. It's okay for you to be a progressive and also be interested in Bitcoin and where those values align. So we talk more about that and just his, his work, orange billing and educating people about Bitcoin and all of those positive stories. And we get into a little bit of politics as well and talk about the upcoming election and how, once again, we're kind of in a situation where are there favorable candidates for anyone at this point? It seems like it's going to be a very interesting uh, year, especially for, for us in the U.S. that fortunately or unfortunately has ripple effects for the rest of the world. Uh, so thank you for tuning in to this conversation and be sure to share it with folks that are interested to hear from uh, Jason. I know he's been taking a little bit of a break very intentionally from being on social media and talked about, again, the un the importance of unplugging from Bitcoin Twitter and things like that. And, you know, been taking a sabbatical himself and spending more time with family. So excited to have Jason on uh, for you folks to hear from him again. And of course, we're going to put the link to his book. If you still want to send that book to friends or family of you yourself have not read Jason's book, A Progressive's Case for Bitcoin, I would really encourage you to get that book and check it out. It covers so many topics in Bitcoin um, and is a really good entry into Bitcoin while also being a really good resource for folks that have been veterans of Bitcoin to get a second perspective, uh, uh, take a closer look at Bitcoin from a, a progressive's view and how it works for different tools and things like that. So a very, very good book uh, for folks, especially coming into this halving cycle and all of the craziness that might happen this year. So be sure to check out uh, that as well. And before we get to the episode, I'll also mention our awesome sponsors, SAS Mining, where you can take advantage of the promo link before things get too crazy with price action. It's a really good time to get in and purchase miners. You can get $50 off your Bitcoin miner uh, and they do Bitcoin mining with 100% renewable energy as well. So you can get $50 off using the promo link below. And then Bitbox, my favorite Bitcoin hardware wallet to safely secure your Bitcoin. You can get 5% off your purchase as well. And I'll also mention we have a new sub stack as well that we've been rolling out. So you'll get episodes of the podcast released every Tuesday and then a newsletter that's covering the news from the week. If you don't want to scroll, scroll through Twitter and all these other sites to try to figure out what's going on, we try to wrap things up in a really nice way with progressive values in mind. Uh, the TPB Weekly Digest that we drop every Friday as well. So you can check out our sub stack uh, in the show notes below and be sure to subscribe as well. All right, I will let you get to my conversation with Jason. And if you have any feedback, you can reach out to me at hello at progressivebitcoiner.com. All right, we will see you again next week. Hey, Jason, welcome back to the Progressive Bitcoiner. How are you? Great. Thank you for having me, Trey. I'm excited to be here. Happy New Year. Yeah, or, Happy New or, Year. <laughs> yeah, for us, for us, we're recording a little bit before the holidays, but by the time this is out, it'll be uh, it'll be the New Year. So, Happy New Year to everyone listening. And I know people will be excited to to hear from you because you're on a bit of a sabbatical and um, taking a little bit of a, a break from from things in terms of you know teaching and things like that. But mm -hmm. but how how has that been for you? Yeah, no, uh, my year has been great. My school, uh, you know, for the people who don't know, I'm a high school math teacher and. Uh, my school was very gracious and generous and gave me a year-long uh, sabbatical to promote uh, 
a progressive case for Bitcoin and to sort of tour around and, and take a little bit of a break from, from my day job. So this whole year has been uh, mostly just sort of family time, Bitcoin time, book time, you know, book promotion. And uh, it's been amazing and great. It's everything that I kind of hoped it would be. Um, plenty of time uh, to be with my wife and my kids, plenty of time to travel around and talk about Bitcoin and, and the book that I wrote. Um, and it's really been perfect. So no complaints. Uh, can you let folks know a little bit of, you know, what does that look like for you in terms of promoting your book? And, and what are some of the types of things that that you've been doing at this point? And if people don't know, they can listen back to past episodes. At this point, people have seen us talk about you and your book and mm -hmm. promote yeah. that and, and things like that. Um, but for you, what have those types of events been like? And what are some of your your favorite type of uh, events <laughs> to do in terms of, you know, your focus as an educator, what the book, book's purpose is? You know, where right. do you feel most at home when talking about your book? Uh, great question. I think that, um, you know, the book is is really written from an educator's perspective. Like the hope is to just onboard people from zero to one onto Bitcoin um, for people who don't really know much about it. My goal has always been to to make people feel comfortable in the space. And if you're sort of new to Bitcoin, like provide a resource that might speak to them and allow them to learn. Um, and, you know, I've been very fortunate to be able to travel uh, all around the country, all around the world uh, a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and and also very locally too, you know, where I live up in the northeast of the U.S. So, um, you know, I was able to go to Pacific Bitcoin. Um, I was able to go to Amsterdam and speak uh, at Bitcoin Amsterdam at the conference. Um, all of these include like meeting people, signing books, um, you know, selling uh, people books, and and be able to meet them on the ground. Um, and I think probably those are all great experiences, being able to travel to Pacific Bitcoin and speak on stage, being able to go to Bitcoin Amsterdam and speaking on stage. These are all great experiences. Uh, my favorite is still like the local meetup. Like you tra travel mm -hmm. to like a small group of people who are committed to Bitcoin and want to learn more. Um, and there's a couple of different options that are within driving distance from where I am. And those continue to be the best because you just get to meet real uh great people on the ground who are just normal, who, you know, they all have day jobs. They're not like Bitcoin influencers or anything. They're just mm -hmm. regular people and they want to learn and talk about Bitcoin. And um, that continues to be really kind of my favorite experience is to, you know, get in the car with a pile of books, uh, go talk to people in real life, uh, face to face, answer questions and uh, just get to meet people, uh, you know, person to person uh, has been a really good experience. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to do that. Like, around the Northeast, you know, New York, Boston, Albany, Hartford, Springfield. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be going to Philadelphia um, in January. So, um, nice. you know, there's all sorts of opportunities like that. And those are, that's probably my favorite. And the, uh, the, the bastion of progressive and, and liberalism, <laughs> right? And the, uh, and the coast. Right, yeah, uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, well, certainly, uh, yeah, the, audi the, the target audience is there, right? Like the target yeah. audience for my book and for what I've tried to do is, is people who identify as progressive, uh, who don't know anything about Bitcoin, except maybe what they've heard in the media. So uh, certainly mm -hmm. in the Northeast and on the West Coast, there's plenty of people that fit that category. Do you, uh, one question I have for you, even since we, you know, spoke last, like five months ago on this podcast um, and in previous conversations, I'm curious if you've thought and reflected on, I mean, we can go back as far as when you first had the idea of the book and then you were on what Bitcoin did and people got to know you a little bit more. That's when I got to know you and then doing these things. Do you feel like there's been a bit of an evolution in terms of the things you're talking about? Um, I, I've been talking with a few, you know, progressive Bitcoiners and Logan and I were talking about this recently mm -hmm. where we feel like, at least I feel like we're getting, it's a good thing. I think we're getting a bit to a stage where there's more educational material out there. There's your mm -hmm. book, but there's hopefully this podcast. There's a bunch of other things, Peter's podcast, more books, um, more people mm -hmm. talking in very mainstream ways, whether that's economics, whether that's literally businesses talking about ETFs. Um, so I feel like the education front is improving. And I mm -hmm. feel like the message for progressives is then shifting a little bit away from like, what is Bitcoin at the very entry level? There's still that and there still will be that, mm -hmm. I think, for a little bit, but right. on to some more uh complicated elements i'd say for progressives like does it address inequality how does it how doesn't it okay bitcoin mining okay let's dig into that a little more some of the more complexities rather than right. the, just the basics of like okay bitcoin is backed up by math there's 21 million you know some of that <laughs> yeah. do you feel like 
your focus has continued to be on that? Or do you feel like that conversation has evolved a bit, whether it's at, you know, some, uh, well, a lot of these events, you know, you're speaking to Bitcoiners, but whether it's people reaching out to you about the book, just some of the the normies in your life, things like that. Yeah, I think that the answer depends on on who it is having the conversation. I think mm-hmm. that the there's definitely been an evolution when I speak to Bitcoiners. First of all, we like you and me and a few others and you know plenty of others have carved out a space. Mm-hmm. So it it almost the idea of like a progressive Bitcoiner is like has lost a little bit of shock value, which I count as a good thing. Yeah. Like like what do yeah. you mean that yeah. doesn't make any sense, right? Like a lot less mm-hmm. noise like that. Um, so like those conversations just have a different flavor to them. Um, I would say that the conversations I have with normies who like are not into Bitcoin yet and are maybe a little bit curious and have some misconceptions, those all kind of seem consistent. (laughs) Like it's Mm -hmm. just sort of me like countering some of the misconceptions and the, and the false information that's out there or or just earnest, you know, answering earnest conversation, uh, answering earnest questions from people who just want to know more. Um, so mm-hmm. a lot of that remains the same. I don't think that um, the you know the people who are in my life who you know know that you know know that I'm into Bitcoin, so they view me as a resource. Um, they're asking very similar questions as you know what they might have been asking a year or two years ago. Um, but the yeah. conversations in the Bitcoin space have evolved, um, and and mostly in good ways. Um, certainly, um, you know, like we're we're all in this sort of space and we hear sort of similar things over and over again. And it, sometimes that can be frustrating. Um, but for the most mm-hmm. part, um, I think that we've at least starting to, if we haven't already, we're starting to graduate away from like the, the sort of baseline. Like, let's just talk about like, how can a progressive even be into Bitcoin? Like we're, we're having a more interesting conversation within the space uh, by now. So it's good. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. Um, I'm getting less trolling and I'm, <laughs> I'm sure and hopeful that you are as well. I think um, a lot of folks, when I spoke to Lynn on the podcast, one thing she said is like not having folks from the left or progressives or, or whatever you want to categorize this wide variety of, of people in the United States, but in many Western nations, um, without having that, it's like you're you're losing like 50% defense. Like that's a defense of the Bitcoin network um, is right. having people advocating Having progressives like myself and so many others saying, hey, Elizabeth Warren, you don't speak for us. We're right. progressive and can be with you on X, Y, Z, but not that. Like, no, like that's super important to the network. Um, and it just happens to be skewed that way, right? If it was skewed the other way, I'm sure the opposite would be true as well. Um, right. So I think a lot of folks have um, caught on to that and said, <laughs> okay, makes sense. We want Bitcoin to win. Like we're exactly. I, and I feel like yeah. that was the mantra for the first like year and a half of me being a public figure in the space was like, do you care more about Bitcoin winning in the end? Or do you care more about getting a cheap shot in at me because of some sort yeah. of like, uh, you know, identity politic that you're that you're attaching to me or that you're assuming about me? Um, yeah. And for, you know, most like thoughtful, um, careful people in the space, like they care more about Bitcoin. And then you had those trolls, right? You had those people out there who no matter what yeah. you would say, they're going to sort of put words in your mouth or try to make some argument um, against you. And I feel like that, at least in my perception, has gone down. And it's just more people recognizing the importance of having all different kinds of voices in the space. And also the acknowledgement that right now, like we're still at a spot where most of the voices in the space are more conservative, uh, right-leaning, mm-hmm. libertarian. Um, and that's fine. I'm not trying to change that necessarily. We just want to make them for everybody. And I think that's starting to happen. Um, and people are just, you know, thoughtful people are respecting the need for that. Because as you say, if it's only one side of the political spectrum that's advocating for Bitcoin, it's very easy for other people to dismiss it. It's very easy for politicians all around the world to not care about it if it's only one sort of niche uh, political segment. So uh, we're trying to, you know, broaden the tent make Bitcoin accessible to everybody, make everybody feel welcome. And, um, you know, we're starting to do that. I think like it's actually mm-hmm. happening. It's great. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, th- this episode, the timing of this episode being um, the first or one of the first episodes back in the, in the new year, you know, it's really cool to have you on and kind of reflect, you know, reflect on this past year and then look to, um, it's really foggy for me, like 2024. <laughs> I mean, in terms of Bitcoin, yeah. we have a yeah. potential ETF. It, it could be here already by the time this conversation is out. And if so, 
you folks can can laugh at me for not even realizing it and you know um in the moment but it could be right around <laughs> the how- corner from this conversation right it could be delayed there's so many different things that, that could happen there um we've got a very interesting and messy political cycle and election coming up um a previous um president and presidential candidate who may or may not be going to prison. We have a bunch of independents running. Uh, yep. We have Democratic pri- primaries being canceled. Um, we have, at the time of this recording, President Trump is not on the ballot in Colorado recently. Um, th- it's just a, a, a big year. I mean, the having there's so much yeah. in 2024 that is very exciting. There's some things that are scary, that feel big. Mm-hmm. Um, how are you taking in this year and and looking ahead yeah so like happy 2024 um yay um we made it yeah yeah, well yeah at at the time of recording it is 2023 (laughs) you know it is 2023 we're 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 optimistic um so yeah we're i think that you just listed off a ton of things right that we like all of which is a certainty right there will be having um there -hmm. will be a messy political like cycle presidential election cycle in the united states like that's a it's going to be a super important in terms of um well every topic but bitcoin specifically um and how sure. can- candidates talk about it and how politicians treat it um you know i like i've, I've been in the space long enough to know that like it's just hard to make predictions like who knows right like we might yeah. all assume that like oh 2024 is going to it's going to see Bitcoin rip and like adoption is going to grow and the halving is going to like, you know, force the price to go up. Like all of that stuff is likely or like probable, but um, we don't really know what's going to happen. So mm-hmm. um, it, it, I feel like the like, how do I take it all in and how do I process it is like as it comes, right? Like separating like the speculation or the guessing uh, from like, what do we know? What are the facts on the ground now? Um, and then just sort of continuing to like be, make myself available, right? Like if things mm. go the way that I think they will uh, for this year and the coming years, then, um, you know, Bitcoin will start to look very attractive to lots of different kinds of people and they're mm. going to want to learn and they're going to want to know more about it before they you know, dump a bunch of money into it or whatever the case is. So um, just to continue to make myself available and to keep pushing the, the word and making sure that um, people understand it's more complicated than just sort of like a investment to make more dollars, all of that stuff that you and I have talked about. And, um, you know, a lot of people in the Bitcoin space are aware of, but a lot of normies out there still think about it as like, you know, this is just an investment tool. It's, it's a way to make more dollars. It's the same thing mm-hmm. as crypto, like all that stuff is still happening. Right. So like yeah. there's a lot of education that still has to happen. Um, yeah. yeah so sure. like, and, and so, we can dive in and I'll let you ask me, but any one of those specific things that might happen in 2024, I can dive into, but like, it's just, who knows, right? Like this world yeah. is, is getting messier and more complicated by the day, it seems. And so, and Bitcoin is, is one piece of all of that. And um, one thing I am feel confident about, like, you know, the end of 2024 isn't going to be any less messy or complicated than the beginning of it. <laughs> because, you know, yeah, we, yeah, can yeah. Count, we can count on things being kind of like, you know, who knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah, or some folks are like, this is how 2024 is going to go. And then uh, we're going to get through it and everything's going to be great. It's like, well, that's probably not going to happen <laughs> exactly that way. Yeah, I, I remember saying um, the same thing in 2020, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, well, what, what important point that you made. So I, I came into Bitcoin in 2021 after, I mean, I think initially even purchasing it after the first peak. Um, before the all time high, I think it was like 59 or 60,000, then came down to like 30. That's when I bought. Yeah. And so, and kind of trying to ride that. So, you know, I am also aware that for many people, 2024 will be that year for them right. where we could see similar things. There could be a yeah. run up, there could be a comeback down. It depends on, you know, the price action of the ETF versus the having, um, how many people are actually selling the new, you know, all of these things that people are saying. And I'm like, I don't know if it'll work exactly like this, this time. Um, but I think yeah. a lot of folks will come in that are, that are new. And, you know, I, I'm hoping what's nice is I feel like there are even more people. I mean, there's, there's more podcasts, ours, but so many others that are, that are popping up too, that I think are really valuable resources. There's more like women in Bitcoin that are talking about mm-hmm. their perspectives. Um, yeah. There's more really amazing like content stories from Africa and content from, I, I've been connecting with a lot of African Bitcoiners. I think there's a lot more rich 
and a variety of content that some folks that they don't want to listen to a white guy like me from America. There's so many other stories and so many other things in the Bitcoin ecosystem that yes, it's content, content creation that, but it, but it's literally education and more resources. Um, and that's really exciting to me. Right. And, and it should be because the, the Bitcoin world that you entered into in 2021, it does not look anything. It doesn't look like that anymore. No, right. Yeah. Like there's so yeah. many, like you say, there's just so many more resources. So for people who are, genuinely interested and curious about learning more and wanting to dive into it. Um, you know, even like when you and I started into Bitcoin, there was plenty of like ways to learn, but you know, mm -hmm. there was maybe sort of a monolith in terms of like the group thing that was happening at the time. Um, but yeah. I think that right now we have, we have tremendous advocates and educators and podcasts and books and resources out there. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's, you know, non-for-profit organizations out there trying to spread the good word and like, you know, advocate for, you know, favorable legislation or just educate policymakers. Like there's all sorts of things happening. So I think it's a good yeah. time. And, you know, I've, I've said multiple times in the past, like, you know, the book that I wrote, you know, is really geared towards like the class of 2024 Bitcoiners. It's not, it's not mm -hmm. for, you know, or maybe 2028, right? It's, it's sort of like, yeah the people coming into it who are going to take a look at the space and say, all right, well, let's dive into this. Let's actually spend the time and energy to learn it. Um, you know, those people have lots of options now and I feel grateful for the space and for the, you know, the growth that I've seen, um, you know, for people mm -hmm. like you and, and many others who are doing really great work, just putting content out there and making sure that there's options and resources available for people. That's huge. And it didn't exist at least not like this, you know, four years ago. Um, so that's great. Hi, everyone. Hope you're enjoying the episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitbox. Now, Bitbox is a hardware wallet that's open source, incredibly secure and easy to use. And it's what I'm using to safely secure my Bitcoin in cold storage. Now, I know self-custodying Bitcoin can really be intimidating, but Bitbox is designed for ease of use without compromising on security. It's USB-C compatible and allows you to easily back up and restore your private keys with a micro SD card, which is really cool. Now you can purchase the Bitbox using the promo code TPB at the link found in the show notes for 5% off your purchase. And I really want to thank Bitbox for their support of the podcast. And I'm really excited about this new partnership. All right, I'll let you get back to the episode now. One of the things that, you know, all of this is tying into to one of the themes that you had when we were connecting on, you know, what do we want to talk about? What do we want to focus on? One of the things, and for me, it's not really a pessimistic or negative view, but the, the understanding that Bitcoin is not inevitable, right? I mean, the mm -hmm. reason all of us are doing what we're doing is because we know it's not inevitable. There are right. a lot of people actively fighting against it daily. In general, it needs to be supported movement-wise. People need to use it. People need to believe in it. Uh, people right. need to understand it. In addition to all of these forces that either intentionally or, um, or kind of covertly don't want it to exist, right? I think right. there's so many different, different forces. So yeah. for you, when you think about you know, Bitcoin is not inevitable. Um, mm -hmm. what, what, what does that mean to you? Is, is that something that it's like, it's very top of mind present to you? Is it something that you're like, I think it will work out and be okay, but I'm kind of aware of it. Where does that sit in terms of priority for you? Yeah, um, this is something I think about a lot, right? I think that there's a lot of Bitcoiners out there who, who very rightly come to the conclusion, well, this is the best monetary technology that we've ever had, right? So that's a... Mm -hmm. You know, okay, that's an opinion, but even if you assume that that's true, it's not a guarantee that it will take off and be adopted yeah. and be used for the ways that, you know, like just because something is a better technology than what it's replacing does not mean that it will actually be successful. There's plenty of examples mm -hmm. uh, where that's not the case. And I think that um, for me, it's, it's always important to remember because I just think that Bitcoiners sometimes get locked into this hubris kind of notion where, well, like we've got the best thing and therefore it's going to work. Well, that's not mm -hmm. true necessarily. Like I hope it does. And I do think it will. Like I'm optimistic that Bitcoin will work, um, mm -hmm. how it works and how quickly it works. All that stuff is up to for debate and, and we have to see. Um, but mm -hmm. it is something that's on my mind a lot because I think that, um, like you said, there's pretty powerful enemies of, against Bitcoin who don't want to see it succeed or who benefit mm -hmm. from the old system. And so they're going to fight it. I don't even think that's the number one threat. I think the number one threat is just apathy from yeah. the normies and not the people who are like in pow political power, or like banking industry who want to see mm -hmm. it suppressed or anything like that. It's just pe normal people who do not have the time 
or energy um, to spend thinking about like the definition of money and like how can we actually make the effort because right now it actually does you know it is an effort like adopt bitcoin learn about it use it um mm-hmm. there there's a lot of steps that need to happen between now and like some sort of um you know mass adoption or bike you know uh bitcoin hyper is it hyper bitcoinization is that what we say mm-hmm. um yeah. there's a lot of steps between now and then right including making it easier to use uh, making sure people understand what it is um and um, just educating people who really, in, in a in a way that makes sense, don't have the headspace to actually spend and devote like their life to it. Like you and I have mm-hmm. decided, wow, this is really important. And I'm going to really dive in. I'm going to spend thousands of hours studying Bitcoin. <laughs> You're mm-hmm. going to do a podcast. I'm going to write a book. Normal people are just trying to put food on the table, right? And right now their debit right. card is what does it and it works fine. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, at least in America, I think that this, this apathy is like the like enemy number one. Uh, how can yeah. we get people to care about this and understand that Bitcoin is a solution to some of their problems or could be a solution to some of their problems? Um, and and that's sort of like how I view it. Like, I don't think that we're doomed or I'm, I don't have a pe- pessimistic view. I just don't want to sit back on my rest on my laurels and think, oh, everything will work out because it's better than the dollar. Or, you know what I mean? Like, and, and therefore, like, I'm done working for a better future, right? I think that everybody has to chip in and kind of work towards the future that they want to see. And whether it's Bitcoin or, or anything else. And, um, you know, the more we start thinking about Bitcoin as a goal and something we want to happen and that we have to work for and less like, well, it's inevitable, um, the better off we're going to be. Yeah, I completely agree. And you mentioned hyper Bitcoinization. <laughs> um, that was one question from uh, our friend Ben DeWall. Shout out, Ben. Um, mentions, um, and it's not a new topic on this show. We uh, Each guest almost kind of touches on it. But, you know, if you have an opinion or a thought, this is a question he had posed on, on Twitter when I mentioned I was going to be chatting with you. Mm-hmm. If you have a thought on hyper-Bitcoinization, if that um, is a good thing, if that is something that you think is inevitable, like when will it happen? Will it happen? Um, what is your view on on that in terms of, let's say, a general uh, definition is hyper Bitcoinization means everyone around the world uses Bitcoin like it, it is a right. it is a Bitcoin standard world. Yeah. Um, whereas now it's like a euro dollar standard world. Yeah. So I think that my answer like right like today is probably different than it might have been six months ago, um, because, mm. you know, uh, one of the things that I've done during my sabbatical is get off um but I'm on Twitter a lot less frequently now. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was very intentional. And so shout out to all of the people checking in on me who send me DMs say like, I don't see you on Twitter anymore. Is everything okay? Everything's great. Um, Cause I'm yeah, not on you're Twitter like, Everything's even better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so when you're on Twitter all the time and you're just surrounded by Bitcoin people yelling at you or yelling with you, um, yeah. then all of a sudden, like, hyper bitcoinization seems like inevitable it's right around the corner and like oh my god look at this new thing like oh this company mm-hmm. is accepting bitcoin and that means it's going to moon all that stuff just like turn off that noise and just go outside and like live a little bit talk to regular people like mm-hmm. bitcoin like hyper bitcoinization is not around the corner like hardly anybody knows what thing is um yeah. you know like so i i just think that we actually are a long way off like longer than i would have guessed like when you're really plugged into like the Bitcoin, um, you know, echo chamber and like mm-hmm. the space, it just feels like inevitable. Like eventually everybody around the world will see what we see. And like we have this vision of the future and everybody's going to just climb on board. Well, yeah, I think that's probably going to happen. And I'm excited for that to happen. I'm optimistic. But like we're probably a long way off. Like most people mm-hmm. just still like they don't know the difference between crypto and Bitcoin and they, uh, you know, Michael Lewis puts out a new book and everybody dings me and say, oh, what about this? You know, it's like people are just so right. kind of like lost in the weeds about it. So mm-hmm. the the prediction about like, well, when does that happen where everybody in the world is able to use Bitcoin as a tool? Um, like, I hope it's within my lifetime. But to be honest with you, like, I don't know that I, I can't say with any confidence that it will be. I do think it happens. I can't say with confidence that eventually it will happen unless there's some mm-hmm. catastrophe um, that happens in the world before then. But um, I think it will happen eventually. Just I don't know when. Um, and I'm I'm okay with that too, right? Like I'm 
like I do think that one of the dangers is that a sudden and drastic um, shift to a new monetary system that most people don't even understand the first one, much less like shifting, Mm -hmm. um, could be really um, dangerous to the people, you know, the working poor people of this country and and the world. um, And they're going to be caught unawares. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of turmoil that happens. So, um, yep. You know, it's not like a pessimistic, like I'm being negative, like, oh, hyper Bitcoinization is going to happen somewhere in like the distant future. But that's probably a good thing. Like, let people mm-hmm. learn, let, let it grow organically, let it grow from the bottom up, hopefully, like, you know, by now, mm-hmm. who knows what what's happening with this ETF. But the more we can just sort of spread the message and get people on board from the bottom up before, um, you know, price moons or adoption goes through the roof and people are forced to get Bitcoin, you know, when they don't mm-hmm. really know how to do it or what it, what it is, the more time, the better, uh, to be honest with you. I know, like, I'd love for me, you know, I'd love for just to be independently wealthy because I like got into Bitcoin, but like, I'm not, that's not my goal. The goal is to make the world mm-hmm. a better place. And I think that a slow adoption curve is probably like the most likely way to have that happen. Well, what's interesting is, yeah, I, I agree with you on that. And I think if I'm being honest with myself, yeah, Bitcoin mooning is really great for me. I think it gives me more flexibility to do what I want and more things with this podcast and the progressive Bitcoiner as a company and idea and all of these things. Mm-hmm. It'd be nice to not have to rely on so many other things. I think people want to be financially independent at the end of the day, regardless of your political ideology, right? right. Like, like that. that's kind of a thing where it would feel good for a lot of people who are strapped by student loan debt and millennials or, who, or whoever, whatever situation. But I think if I really take a step back, thinking about we're in this because we want, uh, we feel like this is a better option for humanity. We want to help people. Um, right. I would like a lot more time and a lot um, stagnant price or lower price so we can continue telling stories of like Bitcoin and human rights, Bitcoin and the environment. You mm-hmm. know, what Bitcoin is, better savings for you and your family and future generations so people can get right. onboarded and then appreciate that price action or, right. you know, have, have it be this more gradual um, thing because this is a momentous just movement and it would be a huge shift so uh that right. is within me that that duopoly i look at it and sometimes like yeah. the price right again looking on twitter looking wherever but then yeah. taking a step back i'm like i want people who need bitcoin the most and could really appreciate this price action or this censorship resistant quality or whoever to learn it know it and have it when that happens right <laughs> and, 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 and and many people might miss that initially it will still benefit them, right i think but that's kind of yeah. where we're at. And, and I think that, you know, I, I hear, I think I see you on Twitter, you know, usually pointing out like this whole notion of everybody gets Bitcoin at the price they deserve, right? This is just yeah. like, I, you know, people say this um, and I, I totally get it, right? Like it's, it's hard to be in a space where you kind of know the quote unquote truth and everybody gives you know, out there in normal mm-hmm. world gives you a hard time and you just sort of get jaded and bitter and say, well, you know, F you, you'll get Bitcoin at the price you deserve. But this is not um, like the, the like the progressive wing of the Bitcoin you know coalition. This is not like a yeah. progressive idea, right? It's like let's no. let's work to get pe- like Bitcoin out to people who deserve it, who need it right now, who don't have the resources available to them to understand it, the time and the flexibility to buy it. Um, you know, I, I think that the the idea is that well, I have mine, and you'll just get it when you deserve you know, at the price you deserve mm-hmm. is sort of a callous and cruel thing to say. Um, and I think that, you know, you and, and a lot of the people that you interview on the podcast are out there doing that, the work on the ground to say, okay, well, yeah, somebody in, you know, an African village or somebody who's living in South America and riddled with inflation, you know, those people deserve Bitcoin too. And if they don't have the resources available to them to learn about it or buy it, then, you know, it's not, you know, it's not actually making the world a better place, just making some very small group of people very rich, but it's not mm-hmm. actually helping to make the world a better place, which is what Bitcoin's like promise is, hopefully, right? As an aspiration, yeah. we can actually improve the world. Yeah, and I think that I get a lot of pushback on, on that, um, especially because people are like, that's not the point of it. I'm like, I understand. But my world and literally what I'm doing with the podcast, like, you know, trying to be on more social media accounts. Do I want to do that? Not necessarily, like I love Noster, right? But people aren't on yeah. Noster, like our mainstream, like the audience I want to collect more of is right. out on mainstream platforms. They're in mainstream places. I would like to reach more and more 
of those people or else what am I here for? I can chat with, you know, Bitcoin friends all the time. Um, right. We want to grow that segment. So I'm like, that phrase in and of itself, if people don't understand the context, they see that. I'm like, they're like, oh, those like asshole right wing, you know, libertarian Bitcoiners who just want to like hoard wealth and hoard Bitcoin. That's how they view it. And I know that because that's where I live. That's what I hear in my yeah. day-to-day life. That's oh, yeah. what I see. So when I push right. back on that, uh, people will say, well, that's not. And I'm like, understand, like, I know that's not what you mean, but that is the optics of what people think that among many other things. So when I do mm-hmm. it, it's not because I just want to push back or create conflict within Bitcoin, but I'm not here for Bitcoiners. I'm here trying to do similar right. work to what you're doing, which is help reach a bit wider audience and bring people mm-hmm. into Bitcoin. So they don't think it's just for criminals or just for wealthy people or just for Michael Saylor or U.S. based right. libertarians. Like it's yeah. for everyone. It's for anyone who, who wants to uh, learn more about it. Right. And, and, you know, I, I think that there's people that you're not going to change everybody's mind about this, right? There's plenty of people who mm-hmm. think like, this is a totally viable like strategy, right? You just get the, you get Bitcoin at the price you deserve. It's it just, I don't think that it's, um, doesn't represent our better angels, right? It's just like, let's mm-hmm. go out and actually like help people learn about it and, and get right. it. Um, and, and, you know, the idea that, different people could look at Bitcoin and see it as a tool that's used for different things and, and for different purposes is absolutely, you know, what happens with tools, right? And so I can say, hey, like, there's a lot of properties about Bitcoin that are going to make the world better. And I really do want that to happen. And order, in order for that to happen, one of the things that could help is if more people are onboarded before the price goes astronomical um, mm-hmm. or before, like, they're forced to, to adopt Bitcoin because that's the only choice. Like, the more people we get, the stronger our network will be, the stronger the adoption will be, the stronger like the knowledge about Bitcoin will be. And that's just good for everybody. So yeah. that's that's my goal. I, I want to pivot a little bit to, <laughs> I, I was just thinking as we were talking about, you know, the year ahead in the election. And I think, you know, I'm getting more and more comfortable, especially on this podcast, talking about the nuance of things. Um, mm-hmm. Talking about, because we'll have some episodes that are very, 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 a basic understanding of some element or some specific project or some application, whatever. And then some that are getting in the nuances of like with folks like yourself, I like to do this with Logan. We just kind of did this where you talk about the nuances of being a progressive Bitcoiner, like, you know, the progressive party as it is. A lot of us in Bitcoin aren't a fan of some of that stuff. The Republican party as it is, a lot of us are not a fan of that as progressives. (laughs) So it's like, sure. Looking to this, um, election cycle especially it, it's really it's really hard i've never been less excited about two options ever and i'm not that old but i've been through a few election cycles and you know on the one hand kind of biden warren they're kind of like the treasury department the way they've been focusing on bitcoin the way they've been kind of just lying to the american public about inflation and all of these things i'm not a fan of that people's mm-hmm. lives will continue to get gradually worse under that type of system i think then on the other hand again my personal opinion it is a progressive bitcoiner podcast not a fan of trump you know really (laughs) would like to just blatantly disregard immigrants would just blatantly disregard reproductive rights um trans lgbtq rights um all of these things just for show just because this man does not have a moral um bone in his body in terms of any direction so you know I, i i think on on one side, I care a bit more about the latter of what I just said. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think if I'm being honest about about yeah. people, about some of these rights and protections for people at a basic level, rather than who can pump my Bitcoin bags at the end right. of the day. Yeah. But both feel really awful yeah. in different ways about I don't want life to keep going as it is and for Bitcoin to be criminalized and all of these things. Yeah. But I don't want this like nightmare scenario of, of of Trump being back in office or the Republican Party, whatever it is, it has become. Um, right. And again, people listening, if you have an opinion different than mine, it's totally fine. I hope you'll still listen. If not, that's fine, too. But <laughs> I, I just looking at this political landscape. Um, gosh, it's really tough to figure out, especially someone who's like, I'm a progressive or left. You know, we have a, listeners from all over the world, uh, a lot right. throughout Europe as well, that kind of contextualize progressive in their own way. And they, at this right. point, understand what that means. Um, yeah. What does it mean to be from the left, caring about these values, mm-hmm. being a Bitcoiner, and then looking at our options 
in the U.S. I mean, there's other countries that are dealing with this too, but for for our U.S. audience, yeah. um, looking at that, it's like, what do we what do we do? <laughs> well, yeah, and I don't have an answer. Um, I yeah. can. Share well, some your... people will say, "Don't vote." You know, some people will say, right. "I'm just yeah, yeah, removed." Yeah. And I right. have friends that are so removed and jaded from it outside of Bitcoin. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, and I I get that. <laughs> well, and, and yeah, I get that too, right? Like, I, I think that at the point you're trying to make is is valid, right? There, <laughs> Like there are no good options right now in terms of like, yeah. who, who do I cast my ballot for, for president and feel really good about that? Um, mm-hmm. It's, it's the, it just, even if I wasn't into Bitcoin, kind of like you were alluding, like, it's not like a slam dunk. Like I'm not, you know, yeah. enthused by Joe Biden. Um, and certainly his policies cut against a lot of the progressive ideals that I have also, right? Like he's, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, despite what you might hear from Republicans, like, you know, he's pretty centrist and, you know, doesn't yeah. really like, go to bat for some of the things that I care about. So there's no, there's no silver bullet. There's no slam dunk. I, I can say that, um, you know, I, I think you made this point in the past too. And I think you just alluded to it also, like there's, there are more issues in the world than Bitcoin and you sh- like people have to vote or I guess not choose not to vote mm-hmm. um, according to the principles that they care about. And I'll, I'll, I'll just say this. I think that the current political landscape is such that if you find yourself in 2024 voting in America for a presidential candidate because they support Bitcoin, then you're probably um, you're probably not going to get what you what you're hoping for. I, I don't think that mm-hmm. the people who are, are presidential candidates are you know even if they were to get into power, there are no presidential candidates who support Bitcoin right now that are viable options to be elected as it, as it currently stands. But mm-hmm. even if they were to get into power, then their their ability to actually leverage Bitcoin or to use it or to implement it is also very limited. So I I think that if you have five or six things you care about and Bitcoin is one of them, I don't think you're going to be able to get Bitcoin to the top of like actual political efficacy, um, you know, in America in 2024. Maybe someday, Mm. maybe someday you will, you'll be able to cast a vote and say like, here are the five things I care about. Bitcoin is the most important thing. And this person, when I vote for them, is actually going to make Bitcoin a priority and actually help it. That's just not 2024. That maybe is in the future. So if you have other yeah. things you care about, you know, like how we treat migrants or how we treat, you know, gay folks or people of color or people who are marginalized, like if you care about those things too, then you you have to vote with your conscience. And Bitcoin might be in that list. Um, mm-hmm. I, I hope I'm being clear. I, I don't. I'm not saying Bitcoin is not the most important thing. Or you know, if people out there who are listening think that. I just don't think that like a presidential ballot vote in 2024 is actually going to be effective way of, of getting Bitcoin where we need to get it to go. So yeah. um, for me, the answer to like, I think your original question is I'm going to, I'm going to take a look at my options when it's time to vote and vote for somebody who I think is like dedicated to making the world overall a better place in the ways that I think are important. Um, and Bitcoin might not enter into that equation because it's just too early. Like in our mm-hmm. adoption, like political process of Bitcoin, we're just too early for for my like presidential ballot to like be like, oh, I'm a Bitcoin only. I'm a one issue voter for Bitcoin. It's not going to happen that way. So, um, yeah. you know, I, and that said, it's not like I feel great about like the options I have to <laughs> of who to vote for either. So mm-hmm. who knows what will happen between now and then? And, and obviously we'll cross that bridge when we, when we come to it. But um, it's more, it's much more nuanced. It's not like, oh, I'm, I just only care about Bitcoin and therefore I'm just going to vote like that. Um, I don't think that's a good way to, to achieve your goals. <laughs> right. And, and I think folks should remember a lot of people do a, a, a good job of this in Bitcoin, but I think, you know, Bitcoiners, whether, whether someone's new into it or been here for a while, I think people get really excited about it and feel the need to protect it a little bit. But, you know, Bitcoin is a cypherpunk grassroots movement. So if we're looking to a leader to make sure Bitcoin wins, something happened along the way. Like what, you know, what's going right. on there? So I I couldn't agree more with what you're saying about you know, I mean there's so many uh, perhaps someone can be more friendly on the regulatory front, but that also involves Congress. That uh, like right. states can do different things versus federal government. That includes federal judges, Supreme Court judges. Th- there's so many different things right now. That I have a certain level of optimism about the regulatory landscape because we've seen that play out a bit in the legislature and the courts where right. it gets stalemated. Like like um, different laws have come up in the past that have tried to put in different restrictions on Bitcoin and they kind of like fall to the wayside because they didn't get enough support. Um, obviously, exactly. at the time of this yeah. conversation, 
Well, at the time of this conversation, I'm sure like Elizabeth Warren's bill is still kind of kicking around the digital assets bill, but even still, it's not that popular. Uh, Perry Ann mentioned this from the the Chamber of Digital Commerce that, um, you know, in the Senate, even if it's favorable in the Senate, in the House, it's very likely to not actually pass and become a bill that goes to Biden's desk. So again, nuance is really, really important in understanding these things. But also right. like if you're saying this person needs to get in because they like Bitcoin, it's it's a movement, right? It it does not matter long term, in in my mind, my opinion. I'd be mm-hmm. happy to have conversations with folks about this. You know, if it's a grassroots movement, it's about people and society needs to buy into it, or that won't matter anyway, right? Because right. then you have a demagogue trying to force it, and that's not going right. to work either. No, you know, I I think what you I agree with what you're saying. Now, all things being equal, if I have two you know, candidates for any political office in the United States and and I count them as essentially equivalent on most issues. And one of them likes Bitcoin. Of course, I'm going to go, you know. Oh, but, yeah. You know, if I'm not voting for if yeah. Donald Trump comes out tomorrow and says, hey, I like Bitcoin. I'm not voting for Donald Trump. Like, you couldn't make right. me, right? Like, so I yeah. think that all things being equal, sure. Like, let's support Bitcoin. I think that what you're saying is true. Like, we need to be aware of the regulatory environment where we exist. Um, and that's why, you know, you have a lot of people doing really good work on the state level. You know, you think Mm -hmm. about Satoshi Action Fund, who has like connections and is putting bills forward in multiple states and 2024 is going to be a huge year. Um, That's I think that's more important than like, who do I vote for for president, at least on the Bitcoin axis. Right. I just don't think it's we've I don't think that we have matured enough as a movement for that to be like the next step. I, I think you're right. Like it's a grassroots movement. It's a movement of the people. We need to keep it that way. Um, and right now I think that there's a lot of other things that are plaguing this planet and this country and this world. And we need to maybe just think about the bigger picture when we cast our votes. And I, I'm one of the people who thinks you should vote. Um, you know, like I know that there's plenty of Bitcoiners who say, Oh, I'm just going to opt out of the system. Um, that, that doesn't make sense to me, but obviously they're free to choose to, to do what they want. Oh, yeah, it's going to be a complicated, <laughs> um, messy year. I'll be curious if, you know, even the candidates we're talking about right now are even viable at the time of the election. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, the reason I'm talking about this, um, you know, some Bitcoiners, again, it's been less and less, uh, you know, accusing me of politicizing Bitcoin. Well, you know, this is the progressive Bitcoiner podcast and a lot of progressives care about this, this political system. So I'm also talking in terms of that or in terms of, of normies that are like, yeah, yeah, but what about this world we live in? And and I want people to view Bitcoin less as this cultish thing and more as like a tool to address those things in the real world that we care about, right? So we're still very early to the tool aspect. Yes, um, yeah. It, but we're very much present in the, what is going on in the world? There's all these global wars. There's Israel, Palestine. There's Ukraine, Russia. There's mm-hmm. the economic, you know, I, I'm hearing things from the government, but my wallet's getting tighter and the inflation and and jobs, mm-hmm. we could be facing a recession this year. There's so many things going on. So the last thing someone right. wants to hear about is like, okay, the religion of Bitcoin. They want to hear about what are some answers to these solutions. Oh, some of these things might involve Bitcoin. Now that I think is an interesting conversation that I would even be more interested in hearing. Yeah, I think I think you're right because I think um, people like normal people out there working jobs, raising families, putting food on the table, like just don't have the capacity to like dive deep right now into for all of the reasons that you just mentioned. Right. And like they read the news, the world is on fire. Everything's going wrong. Like there's political turmoil in the U S there's political turmoil everywhere else. There's these wars, um, all sorts of other things are going on too. Right. Like to say, oh yeah, and by the way, we're going to upend everything that you think you know about money you don't know, and we're going to change it all all of a sudden is like a step too far, right? So we just need to mm-hmm. sort of meet people where they are and understand like, like the thing that you care most about as a Bitcoiner, and, and I'll say this for myself, I'm sure it's true for you and, and a lot of people listening, like just because you care about Bitcoin more than anything else, and I put myself in that category, doesn't mean that the person you're talking to agrees with you. And they are going to view it like a cult or a religion of Bitcoin or something for like weird other people that aren't me if we're mm-hmm. not welcoming and we're not understanding what do they care about in the real world? How does Bitcoin actually solve those problems? Like, that's what we need. We need more dialogue. Like, that's more interesting conversation than, hey, there's a bunch of Kool-Aid over here. Come drink it with us. And then you'll you'll be in agreement with everything that we're saying. It's just, yeah, the conversation needs to be more nuanced than that. 
Yeah, I agree with that. It, has there, you know, speaking of those type of conversations, you know, you've been doing this more heavily, I mean, definitely the past year and a half or so, but, you know, your orange filling sessions, you've kind of mentioned in multiple places that kind of started off with some teachers in your school. And then obviously now you've kind of seen some more global context to this. Some of those have been conferences. So people that kind of get it, maybe you have to articulate the progressive point a little bit. Mm -hmm. But in terms of your interactions with normal folks that are like, okay, Bitcoin, yeah, I kind of heard about crypto. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Like, have your, I don't want to say tactics necessarily, but, you know, have you been learning things through these conversations over the many, many months, years now at this point, of talking to people about Bitcoin that you're like, ah, I've been changing the approach on this topic or in this way, or based on the context of where we are today? Like, what is your... What is your orange filling approach uh, going into this new year? <laughs> Listen more than I talk uh, is number one, right? And, you know, it's funny that like at this point, I've gotten enough swag where I'm out and about like I'm going to stores and shops and stuff. I have a Bitcoin sweatshirt on or something like that. Yeah, so yeah. It's like these are conversation starters, right? And so sometimes those conversations go um, the way they always have for me, right? Like I'm, I'm, in the room with a teenager and they say, Oh, are you into Bitcoin? Like, yeah, like I, I actually am. Like I I've learned a lot about it and I'm I'm into it. And then those, oh, that's so cool. Like, as in, like, I bet you're really rich and I want to get rich too. Like, tell me about Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? And so like yep. quickly realizing that's the path that they want to take in the conversation mm -hmm. and unwinding that and saying, like, well, it's actually like a tool for social justice and to help the environment and to like actually make the world a better place. Like that's a much different conversation <laughs> than what they wanted mm -hmm. to have. Um, yeah, yeah, but like, uh, yeah, yeah. But like, so yeah. <laughs> that money, <laughs> like when's a good time to buy, you know, like that kind yeah, of thing. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's also like, it happens like I go to a shop, right. And like, I'm, I'm making a purchase and, um, you know, like any, like, I don't really usually miss an opportunity. If like something doesn't work at the store, <laughs> like the debit card doesn't go through or whatever, mm -hmm. like, you know, just to, to mention it or to bring it up or ask like, Hey, do you mm -hmm. accept Bitcoin, you know, at like a local coffee shop or something has happened. Um, I think almost every place I was in, in Amsterdam, when I was there for Bitcoin Amsterdam, um, mm -hmm. you know, I just made it a point to ask about Bitcoin and if they accepted it. And of course, very few, almost nobody did. You know, but yeah. you have like a situation where, um, you know, it was interesting to see just the different monetary system at play. And, you know, I've been to Europe before, but it's been a couple of years. So to actually mm -hmm. see how it is and like to know that, well, like when I go to most places, like I need cash um, if I'm in Amsterdam or, you know, some of these restaurants mm -hmm. don't take cards or things like that. So, you know, it's, it's just an interesting different system that I'm not necessarily mm -hmm. used to. And it just sort of provided a new way to have that conversation and to actually talk about, well, yeah, I'm wearing this Bitcoin sweatshirt. Like, let's actually have a quick conversation about why I am and why I think it helps make the world a better place and why it might help you as a small business owner, you know, like all of those kinds mm -hmm. of things. So like those conversations are, I guess I would categorize it as like, understand the audience that you're talking to, right? Like a, a kid that I'm helping with math homework who thinks it's cool because I'm into Bitcoin is like one kind of conversation. And then like, a business owner or a friend of a friend who, you know, like I visited my, my family for Thanksgiving and their neighbor down the street, like couldn't wait to come down and talk to me about Bitcoin. Uh, um, and right. like, you know, just, and, and he's actually like a monetary historian, monetary historian, okay. not like an amateur, but he has like mm -hmm. a coin collection, like a bill collection, right. like currencies and all that stuff. And knows the story behind like, well, this is a specific Confederate dollar from like the 1800s. And this is like mm -hmm. a coin that was made of gold and they don't make that anymore. Like it was really kind of a really cool source of information, like an expert at this amateur level, but he mm -hmm. was excited to talk to me about Bitcoin. So like, it depends on who's coming to me to like have that conversation, right? Like somebody like yeah. that say, well, look at this monetary technology. And now let's look at this whole collection that you have through like history and historical mm -hmm. money and what was used for money and why was it used? as money in those different time periods in different places. And then having a conversation about like, well, money is really a technology and technology is meant to be upgraded and Bitcoin represents that upgrade. Like that's a different kind mm -hmm. of conversation. So it really depends on who it is that I'm speaking to. And, and the wonderful thing, and you know this, cause you, you know, you're essentially talk about Bitcoin all the time with different kinds of people. Like there's so many different aspects that you can find uh, a connection. You can find a point of mm -hmm. interest with that person to actually have a meaningful, interesting conversation about Bitcoin because it 
you know, money ties into every other aspect of society, right? So if you care about something, we can find a way to kind of work Bitcoin into a meaningful conversation about that thing. Yeah, and, and it, I think it's so important for people too to to talk about it in in those contexts. Again, I can't emphasize enough because I knew what it was like, and I still feel it. And I think so much. And this is to not, you know, if, if someone is still in the most of my family is still like evangelical Christian and religious. I'm very like even even some of the tactics that I think you are more comfortable with that I think suit your style as a teacher and educator doing those things. Some of me is like that's why I like this format. It's like, I like presenting information and if people want it, it's there. Like for me still, I try to find that balance sometimes of like, it's a bit harder for me to bring that up in like a conversation at like a grocery store or something like that. And I think it's because I grew up in that very evangelistic um, environment. Right. So I'm a bit nervous yeah. to come off like this re religious zealot with that. But again, if that's someone's right. style and, or someone is in that fair, religion, that's um, fine. <laughs> And I, was I think a that's a bit fair of thing to be like, there is a little bit of lag. So yeah, <laughs> I don't let me, know, let me just mark it to... right here. Yep. Yeah, no worries. No worries. I'll have Damien edit it. Um, I just added okay. a marker here at F51. Um, so yep. yeah, I, I, I was just saying that like, if you go to like the grocery store or something like that, like for me, it's a bit harder because I'm, I'm thinking in terms of like, I don't want to come off like evangelizing or like something right. that they'll be outright to dismiss. But I think I'm a little bit in my head too much about that as well. So it's it's kind of a balance, I think, with all of this. I think it is. I think it is a balance, and you have to do what is comfortable for you, right? And I, I think it's totally fair to be concerned about like coming off as this evangelical, you know, like um, proselytizing Bitcoin to, mm. for people who are not interested and don't want it. Um, but it's just about being a regular person and going out and doing your thing, and and you know, like it's. Yeah. A lot of the cases where people have come up to me who are strangers and ask me about it is because I'm wearing a T-shirt that says something about mm -hmm. Bitcoin or some or a hat or something, um, you know. And I think that if they're approaching me with curiosity, then I can, I can meet that curiosity. I can ask them questions and I can sort of explain, you know. There, there's a 10 second version, there's a 30 second version, there's a five minute version of what Bitcoin mm -hmm. is, and they can have that conversation with them depending on on what they're looking for. But, um, you know, the, the more people we have out there who are just acting like normal human beings and having conversations with people, the better, right? Because otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, God forbid they should get onto Twitter and read some of the stuff, then they're going to think about Bitcoin in a completely different way. So having a conversation in real life is always probably preferred as long as like people are comfortable and, you know, you're not sort of jamming it down somebody's throat. You're not forcing them to talk to you about it. Um, but if there's a curiosity there, just match their curiosity and find out what it is that they care about and how can Bitcoin match up with their worldview. Uh, that's super important job. And like, you know, we need people to be doing that and you're doing it mm -hmm. in your own way, right? Like you're doing it, you're providing information yeah, yeah, yeah. for people. And if they want to tune in and, and learn about it, you now have given them a great resource, right? Um, and surely if if we see like a bull market price action happening, like you're your phone is going to be ringing, Trey, right? Like yeah. people yeah, know yeah. who you are now and they're going to be asking you and those friends and family who are dismissive right now won't be in the future. And um, it's important for all of us to respond with some passion and love when that happens and not the, mm -hmm. I told you so, you should have reached out three years ago. You're going to get it at the price you deserve. That's not the tone we want to be setting. At least I hope not. So it's yeah. it just important messages and, and lessons to remember for all of us, I think. Well, speaking of price action stuff, I think this would be a good a good segue for our last little bit of conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not something I love to to talk about. I think progressives and left, just in general, money and wealth and all of this stuff is just an icky subject to begin with. Um, but it, in general, like something that is a thing that is coming up or either here or maybe right around the corner at this time of this conversation is the Bitcoin spot ETFs in the US. Yeah. Um, and for better or for worse, what the U.S. does on so many fronts, regulatory, this price action with ETFs and the millions or billions over time that could pour into these products um, will, will change the world in a lot of ways in terms mm -hmm. of how people view Bitcoin. There's already commercials that are out about spot Bitcoin ETFs. Right. Uh, I have friends that work in finance uh, mm -hmm. with some of these different parties. Again, there's no insider information. They're not you know high up in any of these conversations, but they're like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I can't wait to, to allocate X number into my retirement of these right. ETFs. Like it is a, 
I'm having more mainstream conversations with folks about, they're like, oh yeah, the Bitcoin ETF. Like I, I kind of know about that, like in my retirement account or that it will be an option at some point. So some people are right. very excited about that. Um, mm-hmm. How do you view this, this ETF craze? Um, what, what, do you, what do you yeah. think about it? Well, I mean, I think it, I'm ambivalent um, because I think all the things that you're saying are true. Um, you know, a, a, an eventual Bitcoin spot ETF is going to legitimize Bitcoin for a massive number of people. You know, people mm-hmm. who think of it now as like, oh, well, it's a speculative investment and like it's for crazies and kooks and I'm, I'm going to just invest in these things that I know about. Um, all of a sudden, a Bitcoin ETF like appears and it's a viable option for your, like some percentage of your retirement account or if you're an investor, you know, it just it just legitimizes it. Like there's conversations I had about people, you know, with people who are not interested in buying their own Bitcoin and securing it and holding it. Mm-hmm. They're just sort of traditional, more mainstream investment types of people. And, you know, it, it's like, obviously, the, the Bitcoin ETF does two things. It makes it available for people to buy, like, more seamlessly and easily. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but it also legitimizes that purchase, right? Like, I think there's a lot of people out there waiting for, like, the stamp of approval kind of thing. So... All of that, I think, is good. It's going to increase adoption. You're going to see massive price action if it does happen. Like, you know, you're going to shoot up in price. And, and over time, you would see um, retirement funds, you know, pouring into Bitcoin, at least mm-hmm. at some percentage of, of, you know, 401ks and things like that now. Um, I am reticent. Like, I, I think that the other, the flip side of all of that is, like we were saying before, like, we're, like we shouldn't want or need like some approval from on high to like tell everyone else that Bitcoin is okay. Um, mm-hmm. I don't want a Bitcoin ETF to make the price action shoot up for Bitcoin so that people around the world don't, you know, no longer have access to it in the way they might right now. So like, there's a lot of like pluses and minuses to it. And I think that um, ultimately like, you know, would it be great if we could onboard, you know, the Southern hemisphere for Bitcoin and, you know, in all of these countries that don't have functioning monetary systems and have all of that happen before the Bitcoin ETF. Like, yeah, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just like the reality of it is probably like, all right, well, this thing's, you know, going to get approved soon. And again, like, we don't really know (laughs) at the time of recording, we don't know when that's going to be. And and maybe Mm -hmm. it's not going to be for a while. You know, they'll come up with some reason to kick the can down the road, but um, it will eventually happen. And like, there's going to be a lot of big money people who have a lot of resources and a lot of advantages in life who are going to be able to buy Bitcoin or feel like they have permission to buy Bitcoin for the first time through a spot ETF. So you're going to see, you know, all of the benefits of that. But I I just think it's inevitable. Like we can't choose like, oh, we want a Bitcoin ETF, but it would be great if it was four years from now. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like we just don't have that option. So, you know, like I was saying before, like we don't know what 2024 is going to bring. So you just kind of take it as it comes. Like, I'm allocated into Bitcoin right now. Like if the price shoots up because something gets approved and everybody goes into it, like that's good for me. But like, I'd rather Mm -hmm. have the rest of the world get into Bitcoin first. Um, And I don't get to choose that necessarily. I'm just trying my best to get there. Do you, is there any sort of negative, you know, because some of the, the stuff too that we've, we've been sharing a lot of information out. A lot of people have been about, you know, the regulatory landscape. In some ways it's really good. In some ways, I, I kind of consider it a, a dying last gasp from Elizabeth Warren and Camp trying to just control that, you know, you really can't own your own Bitcoin, basically, by, by this uh, right. bill that she's proposed in terms of you, you need to have, you know, <laughs> banking authority, basically, uh, right. to, to utilize right. Bitcoin. So some of me is the, a little bit worried, but less because I don't think the bill would actually pass, but of regulators being like, oh, yeah, we have Bitcoin in the ETF. Like, you get to appreciate price action. And that's Bitcoin. Like, if that is what Bitcoin is, oh my gosh, Satoshi, like, <laughs> no, like this is right, right. Yeah. the opposite of what it is. I do personally think that Satoshi probably, even if it's just in a fever dream or a mushroom trip at some point, was like, yeah, retirement funds are going to invest in Bitcoin, right? I do think that was yeah. maybe on their horizon. I didn't want to say like, oh, they couldn't for- foresee this if they assumed that Bitcoin would potentially grow. Um, right. But some of me is a bit worried that you know, regulators or certain people would be very excited about that. And that is Bitcoin. I'm like, if that's all Bitcoin is, 
I don't want to say it's defeated the purpose because I think a lot of people will benefit their retirement accounts. I think there's a lot of good benefits for your average everyday Americans in this case, um, for right. folks around the world, maybe that are able to access uh, Bitcoin in different ways. Um, but it does feel kind of like this. I hope we don't get caught in this regulatory compliance. It's just going to stay in the ETF. And that's what Bitcoin yeah. is post 2024. I, I I share your concern about that. I think it's probably very unlikely that um, an ETF gets approved and then we find ourselves in that regulatory landscape. Um, Bitcoin is hard. Like, it's actually really hard to get people that like to prohibit people from getting it, right? Like, it's actually really... Yeah. Um, and I will add, this was in for right. U.S. citizens, right? Yeah, the yeah, the yeah, rest yeah. of the world, they'll be like, see you later, U.S. Like, have fun exactly, with that. Exactly, you know? right? And, and so like for, for that reason, like it just, it's like... The United States isn't really incentivized to keep their citizens from owning it. And if, if they wanted to, it's really hard to like stop people from, from buying Bitcoin and, and actually owning mm-hmm. it who want to. Um, I, I do think that it's probably a messaging, you know, uh, uh, issue too, right? Like we need to maybe stay vigilant and make sure that people understand that buying Bitcoin through a spot ETF for your retirement account is not the same as holding the underlying asset in like cold storage mm-hmm. that you like own and are responsible for. Um, but I think that all comes, you know, there's different reasons people want to use Bitcoin and buy Bitcoin and store it. And so like a Bitcoin ETF does serve like one of those purposes. And then there's still mm-hmm. others that we need to be vigilant for and, and work towards and educate people about also. Um, and yeah. so I'm not necessarily worried. Yeah, I think you're saying the same thing, like the idea that that legislation is going to pass, you know, there's going to be gridlock and dissent mm-hmm. from that. So I'm not necessarily worried about that happening. Uh, I think that the biggest fear for me for the ETF is that the price action becomes, you know, such that like the people who could probably afford like a good chunk of Bitcoin right now can't do that, you know, a mm-hmm. year from now. Um, and so that's my biggest fear, uh, you know, about all of that. But who knows, like anything could happen. And, and you know, we could look back on this conversation and feel really silly if it doesn't get approved. <laughs> like you know, we're yeah, waiting yeah. another couple of years or something like that. So it's hard to right. it's hard to make that prediction. Yeah. Well, the amount of um, people assuming and almost one hundred percent believing that it will get passed about a week or two from this conversation when it airs mm-hmm. is staggering. So I would be a bit surprised, but again, uh, you know, crazier things have happened on that front. So. Yeah. We'll see. And there's so many other things. I mean, for folks that are very interested in Bitcoin and price action, like we we kind of forget, like it is the year of the having. Like there are a right. lot of <laughs> other things going on with Bitcoin, like nation state adoption, like the ETF. It's like, yeah, that's one thing on a grand list of, you know, uh, uh, Bitcoin's game theory playing out. Right. No, it's, and it's true, right? Like we're going to see what happens after the having this spring. Um, there's all sorts of, and, and people always try to come back and think and, assign causation or you know like this mm-hmm. is why the price did this or whatever and and there, people are going to play that game and get lots of views on youtube because that's what gets people right. to click on stuff um yep. but really it doesn't in some ways it doesn't matter right like we are up and to the right long term zoom out like buy it hold it understand what you're you're owning um and if an etf helps onboard people because they wouldn't have thought about it before but now it's uh, like legitimized um, mm-hmm. And those people decide to learn more about it. Like that's good for Bitcoin in the long run. Um, yep. There are some downsides, and and we do have to be conscious of this regulatory environment. But like the, you know, to your point, the the next twelve months is is murky indeed, right? Like I wouldn't want to have the job of having to predict what the world looks mm-hmm. like twelve months from now, right? So yeah. and and that's Bitcoin and lots of other things too. So mm-hmm. uh, you know, we just have to, and you know, in the most sort of tuned in way just see what happens right like see what happens respond to the facts and then go from there and that's that's bitcoin that's the wars we have going on that's the inflation we have going on potential recession election like all sorts of things that um just make somebody read the news and get really sad um we just have to sort of like keep keep uh paying attention to all of that as as we go well jason it's going to be a fun year it's going to be an interesting year. Um, what, what, uh, but la- last, last question sure. for you is, you know, what's something that you're really, it can be you personally, it can be thinking about Bitcoin, thinking about, you know, anything really, what's something you're really, um, optimistic for or hopeful for in this new year? Um, that's, that's a good question. I do think that, um, like a Bitcoin specific thing, I am, 
I am excited for the opportunities that I've already had, but also going into the future. Like I feel so blessed to be part of this community. I think that, um, you know, we talk a lot about people trolling us and, and all of that stuff. But the, the reality is like when I meet people, that's like a, that, that's like a very it, small percentage, right? Yeah, 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 it is a small percentage. And when I go out into the real world and I talk to people who are Bitcoiners, you can see the passion and the, the, the love mm-hmm. they have for one another, the way they help people. And I'm excited just to experience more of that. Like I'm, I'm so fortunate because I have um, a job that I love, but I get to take a year off from it and just sort of mm-hmm. explore the world, explore Bitcoin educate people and, and, ha- and meet those people and travel all over the place. So I'm excited about that just as a general statement. Um, and, you know, I've, it's also given me a really fortunate position to be like home with my family, spend time with my wife and my kids and like say mm-hmm. yes to things that I normally can't say yes to uh, because I have a very stressful, busy job usually. Mm-hmm. Um, and so just on a personal note, like I'm going to continue to just soak up as much as I can about, you know, having a sabbatical, having a year off from work and just having time to spend with people that I love. Um, you know, what's better, like what's better than Bitcoin, like your family and the people yeah. that you surround yourself <laughs> with. Right. So, yes, um, yes. that's, that's sort of the vision for 2024, at least for, you know, as far as I can see it. And, and I'm super optimistic and hopeful for that. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Jason, as always. Like, I quite literally would not be doing this if it wasn't for you and seeing you on Peter's podcast a couple of years ago at this point, whatever it was. Yeah. And the wild journey you've been on and me saying, wait, progressives can be into Bitcoin. What? <laughs> like, it's about all these other things. And, you know, there are other folks too. But, um, so super appreciate you oh, in this yeah. space. And, and well, thank you. Doing. I mean, we're all very lucky to have you, Trey. You're doing tremendous work. And, and every time I'm, I'm seeing these episodes come out and the people you're getting to talk to you about Bitcoin and, and the messages you're sending out there are huge. So thank you for, for doing the work. It's, I know it's exhausting. Um, and so keep doing it, man. You're doing great. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I enjoy it. Um, as this episode comes out, as I was telling you, I'll have a little bit of a break where I'm just going to unplug from all of it because it's been a hectic six months uh doing this and so many other things so hopefully at the time of this airing i'll come back rejuvenated maybe a little more refocused um a little less blurry going into yeah and that's good you unplug everyone else unplug too (laughs) yes that's yes yeah absolutely do that awesome but but thank you jason we will talk again soon yeah thank you trey